Deion Sanders and Colorado are changing things up on the recruiting trail. How much is it going to help? And are they going to get some blue chippers? You are Locked On Buffs, your daily podcast on the Colorado Buffaloes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Buffs. I am your host, Kevin Borba. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. We are also brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Joining me is Rivals recruiting analyst and former Locked On Buffs co-host, John Garcia Jr. John, we're happy to have you back. It's been a while, but it's always great to reconnect. Yeah, good to be here, Kevin. Uh, obviously, um, heck of a time to jump back on the pod. Things are rolling. That that buzz we used to talk about, uh, you know, a year plus ago is certainly maybe bigger than than we could have imagined. So pretty cool to see it all uh, come into light. Yeah, I, I, won't, I wouldn't want to call us profits, but I wouldn't say we're not. Um, realistically, we had always talked about if Deion Sanders put effort into recruiting, right, he could throw together a top 25 class. I think he either did or almost did in his first year on the job or first day on the job where Dylan Edwards, uh, Cormani McClain, and guys like this were all flipping to Colorado where it was like, oh, wow, if he recruits, it is going to be dangerous, uh, especially now that he's in a Big 12 conference where there's no premier um, program. So the other day, and we're going to dive into this 2025 class right now, um, the other day, you wrote a great article um, titled, let me just title it for everyone, so if they want to read it as well, Three Point Stance, Colorado's Recruiting Shift, Mobile Quarterbacks, and DJ Lagway, right? And there's a lot of changes happening in college football, and one of the biggest changes, and I think it's flying under the radar except for your story, is Coach Prime's change in recruiting philosophy. And talk to me about what you're seeing and just how he's changing what he's doing. Well, I think we remember the last couple of cycles on how it would go. You stack some early high school recruits, six, seven, eight, ten guys maybe, and then you pause. It's all about the season. We see how the season goes, and then we go all in on the portal. I mean, just totally all in to supplement and get guys who are ready to go, particularly heavy offensive line and so on and so forth. And then maybe a flip or two at the very end if there's another scholarship available. Well, I think you'll probably still see that type of push in the portal and certainly for big flips, but I think the numbers are going to be higher. Clearly, the single-digit high school recruits is, is not enough when you talk about depth and the future of the program. So there's been in the last month, to me, a real pivot in just the, the cast of web, how wide a web you want to shoot with these recruits. And, and I think that's why you saw at the Kansas state game, so many recruits that were frankly, never talking about Colorado, not only talking about the buffs, but scheduling official visits. I mean, Nathaniel Wusu Boateng, five-star linebacker for rivals. I talked to him, I think four days before he scheduled the Colorado visit. And he was like, Hey, my last two trips are in it's Notre Dame, it's Texas. And then a decision. And then in the span of what, 72 hours, Colorado gets involved and gets a visit locked in with the number one outside backer in the country. I mean, that is the power of Colorado recruiting, which I think is important here. It's not just, hey, we shifted strategies and everybody wants to come visit. No, it's it's the efforting that goes into it. And honestly, the, the bravado, the ambition to go after guys who – Again, in a Wusu Boateng case, this is an NFL legacy recruit, right? Been been well known for two, three, four years. Going in late, knowing these guys have relationships with X amount of schools for several years, not months, not weeks. Uh, so I think there, there's an ambitious part of it. And then Colorado knows once it gets those kids on campus, things can change. And we've seen every cycle under Prime. This is where it is a little bit more familiar. Big late swings, big late flips. It started with Travis Hunter at Jackson State. We saw Jordan Seaton this past cycle, Carmani McClain as well, the cycle prior. I mean, there is a confidence once a recruit actually spends time in Boulder with this staff, with this culture, with all the big names and the NFL bright lights that come along with it. It just resonates with recruits. And I think this past weekend was a really good example of not only the strategy shifting, but that strategy working. You're not going to get them all, but you're going to have a puncher's chance. And that's something that we just didn't anticipate. Yeah, not a lot of programs have Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, Bull Bull, um, Carmelo Anthony on the sidelines for a random uh, game on a late Saturday night, right? So let's talk about 
some of the recruits that they're taking a big swing at. You talked about Nathaniel Obi. I, I don't even want to try to butcher his last name. Uh, you got it down multiple times within a couple of minutes, and I was impressed. Um, he also had London Merritt out there from Ohio State, Ohio State commit, excuse me. Um, and then Christian Hudson, who's a defensive line commit to UCF. And then they also have been taking a major swing at some quarterbacks. Um, one of them in particular, Julian Lewis, as we know. And then they took a swing, and I think it's pretty much over, with Keelan Russell, who's uh, the the Alabama guy right now. He's not, he's not going anywhere but Alabama, and he's made that quite clear. But talk to me about those other recruits and where you see Colorado standing with them. Look, they've done a really nice job with, with Julian Lewis for a long time. Um, long time USC commitment before he reclassified to this senior class. And really since that reclassification move went public, before the season, Colorado has been a main player. He's made a couple of visits out to Boulder. And as other schools, Auburn, Alabama, Florida State, have kind of tried and then said, oh, okay, it's not going to work. Let's back off. Colorado is still there. You know, I actually was speaking to a source in, in Atlanta yesterday who says, hey, this thing's not over with Julian Lewis uh, relative to Colorado and Indiana, which is undefeated at this point. So um, while he is firm with USC, you know, he's a smart kid. You know, he's keeping an eye on things. There's a lot of chatter out there about Lincoln Riley, especially after, you know, falling to three and three last week. What could that mean for USC? What could that mean for some of these NFL gigs that open? Because every time that happens, Riley's a candidate. And th those are just some things that the Lewis camp is aware of. And obviously the, the same can be said for Colorado, right? What happens with Coach Prime? What happens with Shador after this season? How does that affect the entire dynamic of the program? So, you get the sense this thing is going to stretch all the way uh, until December 4th, which is the first day of, of the early signing period. And that's as good a news as a Colorado fan could hope for, uh, because otherwise, publicly, everything has been very pro USC. He's taken multiple trips out there already this season, including uh, two weekends ago. And, you know, he's saying all the right things uh, about the Trojans. But again, behind the scenes, Colorado has has taken its shot and continues to do so. Uh, with Lewis, who is, you know, one of the safest quarterback bets in this class and will actually compare favorably to a Shador Sanders. He's not the 6'5", you know, big physical quarterback, but he's compact. He's athletic enough to move. He's accurate. He's on time. A lot of the same things we say uh, about Shador, and that's obviously worked really well in Boulder. So certainly still in it for Julian Lewis. With Awusu Boateng, this is a legitimate late shot. You know, I, I think going into the trip, it felt like, well, uh, you know, there was a hurricane down here in Florida. IMG got an extra bye week and they're like, hey, let's go see what Coach Prime and, and all the fuss is about. Right. And I think that could have been the, the beginning of it. But once they got there, once they spent the time there and they were able to take official visits, Owusu uh, and and London Merritt. And that's 48 hours on the school's dime. I think that's when you start to really change the conversation because you can't like limp into that you know that's that's legitimate interest or it's not uh, and then you can cut it off early as a recruit they certainly did not um again those names the bright lights all of that really you know caught their attention and i think you know when you go to img it's a boarding school you're away from home you are in sort of business decision mode anyway right so what you sell to those kids especially if you're not the georgia ohio state alabama texas battery if you're anybody else you're selling hey come here and help tomorrow it's not a developmental thing. It's not a three-year plan. It's not any of that. It's like, hey, week one, game one, like we anticipate you on the field um, in front of this. you know. And that is something that when you talk about a well-known recruit, a very national recruit, well-established, that stuff can resonate and start to help you make up ground. Then you throw in Sanders and Warren Sapp and the pedigree and, and Shermer and all, all of these connections to where these kids want to go, the NFL – and it could really accelerate things quickly to the point where Boateng told me, hey, they're in it. You know, they're, they're not out. This is this wasn't a one off. Colorado will have a hat on the table when his decision comes in. And, and that's huge. That's huge for for a prospect like that. And with Merritt, he's kind of on the same boat. Longtime Ohio State commitment. Never really looked at other schools. We, we hadn't heard a lot about Merritt and other programs. Certainly they were trying, but he hadn't taken a bunch of visits ever since he moved down to IMG. Uh, and, and again, this bye week opened up and they took the trip. And now Merritt is like, this is really the only other program that I'm considering. And again, this is a long time Ohio State defensive line commitment. Larry Johnson, that whole battery that has been so productive on Saturdays and into Sundays, a guy who's you know seemingly so solid and locked down. Now, all of a sudden, his ears perked up. The door is slightly cracked open there. And, and again, from Colorado standpoint, 
that's all you could have hoped for with those two elite prospects. Now, the one that I have my eye closest on is Christian Hudson. He's uh, a kid who has always been a chip on your shoulder, bet on myself type of kid, um, committed to UCF over some other out-of-state schools in the summer, was at the Colorado UCF game in Orlando, and then scheduled the visit to Boulder. So I think that's a little bit of a different situation. This is a, I saw it. I'm interested. Now let's follow up type of deal. So he followed up and absolutely loved it. I mean, imagine you're an undersized Floridian defensive tackle spending time with Warren Sapp, who had the same kind of trajectory, right? I mean, that's something that um, blew him away. It blew Christian Hudson away. Um, He hadn't really thought about going that far away for college, all of these different things. But the combination of seeing Colorado UCF in Orlando and then following it up with that trip to Boulder, combined with those coaches really has his attention to the point where I think this is closer to a coin flip. I think Colorado has already made up the ground on UCF, obviously in the same conference, same colors too. And now this could be a legitimate coin flip come national signing day. And, and while he is not the the five star uh, or the four star that London Merritt is uh, not as national a name, it's because of the, the business, right? I mean, this is a six foot one, six foot two interior defensive lineman who is hell on Friday nights. I mean, he's one of the most productive defensive tackles in the country. He doesn't have those five-star measurables, so he doesn't have that name recognition like the others do. But in terms of what he does right now, what he does best, this is another guy that Colorado is selling on playing early. And again, Hudson is a chip-on-your-shoulder kind of guy, bet on myself, so he's going to lean into that just a little bit more, maybe even than, than those national guys. So he's the one out of those three I'd keep an eye on in the state of Florida. And then, of course, Juju Lewis. I mean, that until the final whistle, Colorado is in that game, and, and that alone will, will make it interesting. Yeah, and I think to, to kind of piggyback on your point, the playing time thing is a huge – well, not only a huge aspect, but I think Colorado sells a vision, right? For Julian Lewis, it's like, hey, we have a quarterback system where you're probably going to throw the ball – 35 to 45 times a game, right? You're going to have nothing but elite receivers around you, LeJonte West or guys like Jimmy Horn, which granted they'll be gone, but they're just going to insert and plug in more guys from Florida who are the fastest guys in the country who have can make plays at all times. And then you look at, you just mentioned Hudson, who's undersized at defense line, right? They have a guy by the name of Chidozi Nwankwo who transferred in from Houston. Um, he's undersized and that's the blueprint. It's like, hey, Look at him. That will be you next year. That will be you for the next two or three years of your career. And then the linebacker group, they had, I think, arguably the worst linebacker play last year in the country. And now, according to PFF, these guys, it's Levante Bentley, it's Nakai Hill Green. They're two of the best linebackers in the country in the run. And you kind of look at Nathaniel and you're like, hey, this is where you come in right here. We're going to lose these guys, or one of them at least. And then you come in and you play right away. And so they have a pitch. They have a plan. And I also think, and we talk about this all the time, you know how hard it is to meet Deion Sanders in person and turn him down, right? Like that is no easy task for anyone, especially not someone who wants to reach that level, right? I think Deion Sanders is the one coach in college football, along with Warren Sapp now as well, who made it to the pinnacle of the sport, right? Like a lot of coaches, they played some football. Like Kirby Smart played at Georgia. He wasn't a Hall of Fame player by any means. Dan Lanning didn't even play college football. Um, There's a bunch of guys out there who – the elite coaches, they did not make it to this highest level of football, whereas Deion Sanders, that's kind of his, he was a Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame defensive back, played both ways in the NFL um, if he wanted to, right? Was also really good at baseball, and he also was one of the most famous athletes of all time, and so it's hard to turn that down in person. I think we've touched on that a lot before. Um, before we move on, could you like foresee this class growing to, like if you had to give me a number of recruits, right? I think they're around seven or eight right now. Um, what, what do you think this, this class ends at? Is it like 15, 20, 20 plus? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm probably in that 15 range. You know, I think doubling the number you got on board right now would be huge for the buffs, just in terms of getting that combination of guys who, like we talked about, are expecting to play right now. And then mm-hmm. you're still going to supplement that with some depth. I mean, it's just that, that transition from high school to college is rough. I mean, I don't care if you play D3 ball, NAIA, FCS, whatever it is. That transition is a lot, and there's there's not a lot of guys who are physically and mentally ready to make that jump. So inevitably, even if the plan is for all 15 to be instant impact guys, you know, starting in 2025, 
you're going to have a handful of them fall back and, and red shirt and, and be more developmental pieces or depth pieces down the line. So I think that's probably a good range to bet on, probably doubling what, where they're at right now. But I don't think they're going to settle. I don't think they're going to take kids just to take them, just to get the numbers up. I mean, that's that's not something I, I envision Colorado doing, especially, again, under, under Coach Prime. It's going to be about prestige. It's going to be about guys who they feel like – can legitimately come in and, and make an impact. And that doesn't necessarily correlate to, to star value. I mean, some of these guys contributing, you know, Michael Welch was a low three-star guy in the state of Georgia who's making a big impact. You know, it's guys who they think can fit in at, at certain positions and, and really hit the ground running, not necessarily the highest rated. Although, of course, there is going to be some swings for those guys in the process. Always got to take those swings. And honestly, my one stance on Coach Prime's recruiting is, I know he says he won't do this, but if he had a thing, patent pending, Prime 21, right, where you just look at all of the recruits and he visits, say, 21 recruits or whatever, like during the bye week, obviously that's a lot, but whatever it is, like during the bye week or during the, the free period where he comes and visits them in person, I think that would move a lot of mountains for him. Just saying, I feel like that would do a lot. When me and John come back, we're going to be talking about some Heisman chatter between Travis Hunter and Ashton Genty. This episode of Locked on Buffs is brought to you by Fade FanDuel. Excuse me. Hey, NFL fans, you could start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you could check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com to get in on the action. Welcome back to Locked on Bus. Appreciate you guys for tuning in every single day, making me your first listen of the day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So make sure to like, subscribe, follow, share this with your mom, your dog, your friend. Don't care, share it with someone. John, let's talk about the Heisman race. It's typically, to emphasis on typically, a quarterback award, right? It goes to the best quarterback on the best team, and it's pretty obvious every single year who's going to win it, right? I think Jaden Daniels last year was one of the few exceptions. I did a, a full deep dive into the Heisman trophy award dating back to 2013 and it was basically like every winner was a quarterback who threw for 40 touchdowns and played for a conference title the only ones that weren't it was like rg3 it was Jaden daniels johnny manzel was in that crowd and the difference between those guys was they rushed for like 20 touchdowns right so it was either that or the two other players who didn't play quarterback um they both happened to go to alabama so it was Devonte smith it was derrick henry so right now there's no quarterbacks that are currently playing well enough to sort of, I guess, surpass the group. I know Cam Ward's been in the mix. Quinn Ewers has been in the mix. So the two favorites right now, according to FanDuel, is Ashton Genty at number one, Travis Hunter at number two. So let's talk about the chances of A, one of those guys winning, and B, specifically Travis Hunter. Yeah, I mean, look, this is something that has come with cachet, right? Charles Woodson was the blueprint. Deion Sanders before that. Uh, they wouldn't even consider a guy like that, you know, for the Heisman Trophy. But, mm -hmm. I mean, watch one Colorado game, I, I would say, uh, which is Power 5, you know, compared to, to the group of five, which I think is a big distinction, you know, in this conversation. And and the guy is just doing things no one else has done. I mean, not, not even Deion Sanders, you know, played this much offense, certainly not at the collegiate level. Um, the, the stamina, the physicality, uh, and then still the production. You know, you're still talking about, you know, 12 yards a catch, several touchdowns, a couple picks, uh, I think eight pass deflections. I mean, Travis Hunter is is the alpha on every single snap, and that's just not something that can be said with, I think, the rest of these guys out there, especially when you talk about the level of competition. You know, so I, I think if it's about the best player, if it's about the best football player, then it's got to be the guy who is, I mean, I don't have the PFF, numbers in front of me but i'm pretty sure he's very high up as a wide receiver and as a cornerback you know relative to the entire country you know and and there is now precedent for wide receivers taking the heisman so imagine one like this who's also an alpha on defense and making game changing or saving plays all together i mean we all saw that that crazy force fumble a couple of weeks ago as well so if he continues to splash that way and play consistent enough on offense i don't see how travis hunter especially with let's be honest, the brand he has built, which does factor in, because these are humans making the vote, right? This isn't the BCS. This isn't a computer right. tally. These are human beings like you and me watching and casting votes. That brand, that spotlight 
has to matter. You know, Ashton Genty is phenomenal. You know, the Michael Myers stuff, the, the numbers are, are unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's, it is literally the video game with mm. Ashton Genty, but you know, he did it against Hawaii a couple weeks ago. You know, it's, it's not, it's not quite the same cachet as mm. Travis Hunter. And I think you make a great point with the quarterbacks. I think, you know, Quinn Ewer's injury slowed down that campaign. Alabama has an L Georgia has an L, you know, Miami, have they played anyone just yet, you know, uh, a lot of buzz down here for Cam Ward, but right. not necessarily even Cam himself, you know, throwing, he's turning the ball over a lot. You know, I, I think there's a lot to knock on all of these other guys, but what, what are you knocking on Travis Hunter at this stage of the game? You have the G five thing with Genty and all those issues with the QBs. Otherwise, what is the knock? on Travis Hunter. I, I don't know. I don't really have one. He's made the, the flashy plays. He's he's splashed on offense. He's been consistent. He's been available. That that alone, his availability, I think, mm -hmm. is a story in and of itself. So um, it's unique. It, it certainly moves the needle. So I, I don't see why, if it's about the best player, why he is not number one on yeah. the odds list right now. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I wanted to correct a I wanted to give an omission. Um, FanDuel has changed the odds again. It's now Ashton Genty, Dylan Gabriel, then Travis Hunter. Realistically, I still think it's between uh, – obviously, we knew there was a quarterback. We knew a quarterback was going to be in there. Um, but realistically, I'll, I'll give you the path for each person. You could tell me if you agree or not. For Travis Hunter, he has to sort of post 100 yards per game receiving and then – not a pick every game because that's unrealistic, but he's got to have at least one flashy defensive play. Um, obviously, he got injured last week against Kansas State. His odds didn't take as big of a hit as I thought they would, um, considering he only played about two quarters. But this week, he's going up against Tetro McMillan, who is, I think, by all means, the best receiver out West, right? Or at least yeah, one of the best. Is a top 10 draft pick. Yeah. Right. And so if yeah. Travis can limit him, Heisman odds skyrocket up. If Travis can torch an Arizona defense that hasn't been very good, Heisman out skyrocket up. I think of Ash and Genty, like this is what it comes down to for, for me at least. If he beats Barry Sanders' record, right? That I think you he's probably going to win the award. If he doesn't, like say he comes close, it'll be a discussion. But if he doesn't, and like let's just say he falls off in these next few weeks and he finishes with like he it's kind of crazy to say he's gonna have a falls off and he's still gonna finish with like 1700 yards or whatever. But <laughs> right, see, right. defenses figure it out and he's not averaging 10 yards per carry. I think he has to beat Barry Sanders' record. I think that's just kind of the line that us as humans have drawn um, because, like you mentioned... Yeah, he's not going to be on a college football playoff, number one seed, Derrick right. Henry kind of run. So, yeah, I think that's that's yeah. the... And that's the other thing. They got to win. They, yes. they have to win. And, and that's... I think the the line on that is, is more strict. The margin for error is smaller with Boise right. and with any other guy we're talking about here. Yeah, that's a great point because I promise you right now... A Heisman Trophy award is not going to a running back who's on a nine and three Boise State team. They're just it's just not right. Blake Corum, I think last was it last year, the year before, everyone was like Blake for Heisman. He wasn't even sent to New York and he was on the top team in the country. So it doesn't work like that. And then for Oregon and Dylan Gabriel, um, it's pretty straightforward, right? Just be a quarterback, win games, and you'll probably be in the top three. Um, right now, I don't think Dylan Gabriel has done anything spectacular. I've actually been kind of underwhelmed by Oregon, um, but obviously they come off the win against Ohio State, and so everyone's really high on them again. Um, but yeah, those are my three paths for everyone. John, if you had to place a bet right now over with our sponsors over at FanDuel, if you were a betting man, this isn't betting advice by any means. If, I was, if, if I you were a betting man and if this was just you specifically not giving betting advice, who would you feel comfortable, comfortable, confident, and comfortable, push together, who would you feel confident in um, winning the Heisman? I, I wish you would ask me on Saturday night because if okay. Quinn Ewers if Quinn Ewers takes care of Georgia, I think he'll jump up a ton. Whether it's one, two, or three, you know, I'm not sure. But mm. Quinn's been pretty great when when available. Um, Texas has that championship cachet uh, alongside it, so I, I do think he's got the most room to make up uh, over the next few days. But before that, I, I think it's I think it's Travis Hunter. Uh, like you said, Dylan Gabriel, slow start uh, out of the gate. Oregon was was dinking and dunking. They were running the ball a ton. They weren't blowing people out even at the very beginning of the season. Um, but yes, they have the best win in college football to this point. However, again, that could whoever wins Saturday, I feel like that's now the best win in college football. So um, I don't know if Carson Beck will have enough uh, 
you know, not a popularity, but enough to move up if if Georgia can pull it off. Um, but I do think if Texas does, I think mm. Quinn Ewers has an opportunity to move all the way to one. Otherwise, I've got Hunter in there. Uh, Cam Ward has a lot of those things in terms of moving up draft boards. He's very entertaining to watch. He's he's the most Travis Huntery of the quarterbacks, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but they've got a lot, a long way to go uh, until that run can be established. It would have to be more of a Jaden Daniels situation where back half of the season, it's just undeniable. It's this guy, you know, so he's a little bit more TBD uh, for me. So I, I think Quinn Ewers and Travis Hunter provided Texas, you know, holds off Georgia as a favorite. I do think those were going to be the top two after this week. And the Genty conversation will start to trickle down a little bit unless, again, Boise stays undefeated and he starts to threaten historical numbers, you know, every single week. And I'm just not sure how sustainable that part is because we haven't seen it. Right. Blake Corum was great. I mean, all these guys are going to start splitting carries the better competition they play, uh, even in Ashton Genty. So I'm just not sure statistically he can keep up in that regard. John, I appreciate you for hopping on. Tell the people where they can find you and where they can get all the best recruiting news. Yeah, real simple. Rivals.com. Uh, check out your favorite program. We got a lot going on uh, with their coverage this time of year. A lot of visits, a lot of flips. Uh, signing day is getting a little bit closer. So the drama is here. So check us out. Rivals.com. Yeah, make sure to check out John. And we appreciate you for hopping on, John. It's been fun. When we come back, when I come back specifically, I'll be talking more about this Arizona game. And I think it's going to be a great one. I think the Travis Hunter versus Tetro McMillan matchup is going to decide the game entirely. And I'll talk about that when we come back. This episode of Locked on Bus is brought to you by our sponsors over at Hims, Guys, sometimes intimate moments happen spontaneously, and we always want to be ready so we can perform in the bedroom. Hims provides access to treatments that can help, help you stay hard and last longer, giving you the boost of confidence so you can be ready whenever the mood strikes. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you access to afford- affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. Start your free visit today at hymns.com slash locked on that's h-i-m-s.com slash locked on for your personalized ed treatment options hymns.com slash locked on the products mentioned are chewable compound products which are not approved or verified for safety or effectiveness by the fda prescriptions required an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply see website for details important safety information subscription required prices vary based on product and subscription plan Welcome back to Locked on Bus. Appreciate you guys for tuning in every single day. It's always a pleasure to have John Garcia Jr. on the show. We, if For those of you who are newer to the show, um, as you guys know, we're really, really close to 6,000 subscribers. I think we'll be there by this weekend. Uh, myself and John were the initial host of the show. And then John um, moved on to bigger and better things. You know, he's a recruiting analyst for Rivals. He covers the, the southeastern portion of the region, of the states. And so he does a great job over there. So make sure you guys go check him out. Great dude. Love having him on. Let's talk about two guys that we both talked about earlier the show. Me and John, that is. And that is Tetro McMillan and Travis Hunter. I think this is sort of the de facto matchup of this game, right? Travis Hunter going up against McMillan, who McMillan, he he had a pretty solid game against Colorado last year. There was a touchdown where he, I believe he mossed Travis Hunter. And I remember... I tweeted about it because I was like, it was just a great catch. And I was giving props. I literally, my tweet went something along the lines of like, Travis Hunter is one of the best players I've seen, but he's been on the wrong end of two amazing catches. And it was Alec Io Manor and then Tetro McMillan. And so I think the both El- Io Manor and McMillan, which Io Manor is a little bit smaller, they have something in common though. They're big and physical. And I think those are the receivers that Travis Hunter struggled the most with. So we'll see how he does against McMillan last year. Uh, he had nine catches for 107 yards, 11.9 yards per catch, um, and a touchdown. So that was McMillan's stat line against Colorado. And so a little bit about McMillan, six foot five, 212 pounds. He's no Fafita's favorite target. Um, fun little story. My friend's uncle was the principal of their middle school. And so apparently those two guys have been torching defenses since they were in middle school together. Um, they went to high school together. They've been playing together forever. Um, and McMillan is just absolutely tearing it up this season. Um, on the year, this is where I'm looking at PFF's charts of where he's thrived the most. McMillan has done his most damage over the middle of the field, right? He has, um, he has, let's see, two out of five catches, um, on plays that are 20 yards plus 
um, for 117 yards and one touchdown. This is me reading down the middle. Um, he's seven of 11 um, down the middle on 10 yards plus for 149 yards uh, with a rating of 93, which that's where his strongest is. So over the middle of the field, which is where Colorado has struggled at times, or at least I feel like in the passing game, that's where teams have found the most success is over the middle of the field. Um, and then in the zero plus yards, so from the line of scrimmage to the first down marker, he's caught 16 to 17 passes for 223 yards and a touchdown. Um, he's least effective deep and out, outside to the left. He has a rating of 56.3. Uh, they have him and um, Fafita have yet to connect there. They're 0 of 4 and with the pick. So I would love to see Travis follow him around all game. I think if Travis can lock him down, I think that gets him back in the Heisman uh, top two at least he would obviously have to do some stuff on offense because nobody cares solely about defense but i think travis has a prime opportunity to sort of make a reintroduction game or like a restatement game if you will like i think most people who watch colorado know how great travis is but when it comes to the heisman race right it's like one game and you're done one one negative or one not so good game obviously travis went down with the injury so it's not that fair life's not fair and so travis needs a big game here and i think he could realistically make a statement with how he performs against mcmillan um it'll be really interesting i think i think colorado beats this arizona team by 10 points i really do um arizona's favored by three um i just haven't liked what i've seen from them uh, especially on offense um for the most part they've been subpar um they've only scored more than 25 points once all year um, and that was in their week one win against New Mexico. They hung 61. And then Northern Arizona, they 22. They lost to Kansas State 31-7. to And Colorado took that Kansas State team to the brink. Um, Colorado had that game won. <coughs> Excuse me. They beat Utah 23-10. to Texas Tech beat them 28-22. to And then BYU just trounced them 41-19. So I'm not impressed with this Kansas State team. I mean, Excuse me. I mean, Kansas State was solid, but this Arizona team, uh, Noah Fafita has taken a major step back. Uh, last year, he had 25 touchdowns and six interceptions. Right now, he's sitting at a rough eight to nine touchdown interception ratio. So I think Colorado wins this game. And I think if they do win this game, a lot of that is because of the play of Travis Hunter and how he covers Tetro McMillan. Appreciate you guys for tuning in every single day. Make me your first listen of the day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. I will see you guys tomorrow. Um, I'll do my final predictions. It'll be really fun. So make sure to tune in. Everyone have a great day. Again, see you tomorrow. This has been another episode of Locked on Buffs.